Now, the very last words that I read there to you were this. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. This is the first time of the use of that. And so the title this, the disciples were called Christians. And in that, I want to just spend a brief moment by way of introduction. The first thought I want us to look at is the, the descriptive designations that are given to believers. You know, because it's interesting when we see these terms and, and, they're, and they're terms given to us that bear significance and we don't want to lose them because we tend to have defaulted to the idea of Christians. But I want to uh, sense the early words that are there. Uh, just in, in reading that, it says they taught the church for a whole year. It was there the disciples were first called Christians. And that is the predominant word that was used early on here in the book of Acts. And most commonly among the believers of that day was the term disciples. I want to remind you as it introduced us uh, uh, to certain things in Acts chapter 6. It said now in those days when the disciples were increasing in number. They were disciples. They came and taught for a whole year. This idea must not be lost among us that we are, among other things, students. The word often used you know, to translate this is pupil, but we rarely use that word anymore with regard to our own schools. It is a learner a student. It would oft be one even who would be an apprentice and a follower. If someone was a disciple of a particular teacher, leader, or individual, it meant my position is what his is. My actions will be according to his teaching. The idea is that there is one out there of which I am a learner, I am a follower, uh, my desire is to study, to know, to understand, and to do according to his teaching. We must not lose that. In, in, in all of the glory of gathering together in the name of Jesus Christ, in all of the privilege we have of, of worshiping, and the scripture reminds us we have a boldness of access to come before the throne of grace. We must not lose the important value of being a learner. And sometimes it can be lost. And, and, and teaching and instruction and doctrine get past pushed aside in order for uh, other things that seem more encouraging on the surface to be given. But those things that, that if it's just the surface encouragement, you've got nothing to undergird it. You've got no, bound, no stability, no girders, no support base, and it can fall apart in seasons of difficulty. And so we want the whole counsel of God's word and we want to be learners that I might know it. As Peter says, we want to, he encourages them to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do live in a day and age and people like to point fingers that these people have too much of an emphasis on knowledge and they seem to be dry and dead. But then dangerously there's these over here that have an emphasis on emotion and exuberance. But it's not necessarily guided by the word of God. And therefore it can run to extremes and it can be misled in excess. Remember, Jesus said those wonderful words to that woman at the well. The time is coming when those who worship me will worship in truth and in spirit. We love that language of, of the psalmist all the times that says, you know, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart soul, mind, and strength. That's the totality of it. And what is included in there is also the mind. Not mindless. Well-informed. A desire to learn. And I will tell you this. No matter how long you have been in the faith, you do not know it all. No matter how much you have continued to study, there is more to learn. Now, you should and we ought to all grow in having a grip on the main things and those clear, unchangeable things. But uh, growing in an understanding of the details is quite 
important. And I want to note this also. Remember the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6. As he was speaking to his disciples and to others. He said, a disciple is not above his teacher. Luke 6, 40. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. And that's our goal, isn't it? And our ultimate teacher is Christ. Every sub-teacher ought to be faithfully declaring the teaching of Christ. Remember, the apostles themselves were the sent ones to deliver the message of Christ. The Holy Spirit would come to them and remind them of the things he taught when he was with them. Christ remains and always must be the head of the church. And our longing is to be fully like him. And I do ask you this. Are you there? Are you far from there? Yes, we all have a long ways to go, but it is a journey. It is a journey where, that is informed by the scripture and empowered by the spirit. And it is a journey all the days of this life, because even Paul, who to some degree could have a boldness and it would say to people, imitate me, follow me as I follow Christ. He felt he was far enough along. He could actually tell people to follow him. We ought to be more cautious than that. Maybe, but note this, even then he says, I do not consider myself to have arrived, but I press on towards the upward call in Christ Jesus. He, he knew he had not arrived and we don't yet arrive until what? When we see him face to face, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And so we've got to, we want, we want to be a people committed to discipleship. And, and we are all disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to be cautious in that even when, when an individual is active in the process of discipleship, God willing, they and those that they are mentoring are all disciples of Christ. And they don't walk around saying, you know, my disciples. No, we don't want that. We want, to, we want to follow Christ first and above all else. So disciples was the early predominant name. And somehow I think in the, in the modern church that's become a more minimized name. And as such we forget the importance of continuing to grow in knowledge. Learn more and more of who he is, what he taught, what pleases him. Secondly, the scriptures remind us regularly still there in Acts chapter 6. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among yourselves seven men. Jesus said in Matthew 23, where uh, all kinds of various titles and words of human praise were attributed to all kinds of people. Rabbi and teacher and master. He said, and father. He said, no, you, you call no man rabbi, Matthew 23, 8. For you have one teacher, one ultimate teacher. And all other teaching comes from that one teacher. And you are all brothers. That's a second uh, uh, simple descriptive designation I want us to remember. Disciples and brothers. Now, uh, some of the older translations, like a New American Standard, would often say brethren. Uh, because it is an inclusive term. It doesn't exclude uh, the ladies. It is brothers and sisters. It, it puts this picture out there that we are a family. The, the way the scriptures further define that, for example, in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, God's word says this. So you are no longer straly, strangers and aliens as the Gentiles once were to the old covenant. But now in Christ, verse 19 of Ephesians 2, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are members of the same household. It ought to be that even when our fleshly, uh, true birth brothers and sisters and parents are not there for us, when they don't stand by us, when they turn against us, it ought be that we can turn and lean on one another. And we know that, you know what, though maybe my friends may forsake me, though my parents may deny me, I know that my brothers and sisters in Christ 
are always going to be there to bear my burdens with me, to encourage me, to help me uh, lift me up in time of need. That wonderful privilege of being a household of God. And that, that was so astounding because it would take people who traditionally by nationality were at enmity with one another. And it would, t it would break down that dividing wall of hostility that Ephesians says and build in its place one new man. It, it would not only break down uh, uh, seeming racial barriers, it would break down all kinds of social barriers and class barriers so that when uh, Onesimus would come back to Philemon, he would say, you get back not only a slave or servant, but you get him back as a brother. And so just a, a completely different picture and something that we don't also want to get lost as we do live in an age where there oft is increasing fragmenting and individualism. We don't want to miss this. In Christ, we are one family. And don't miss this. Household of God built on the foundation, Ephesians 2.20. Of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself. Being the chief cornerstone. So built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So it's those who are what? We are united together because we stand on the same gospel. We are united in the same truths. Those that Christ the cornerstone has delivered to us. Through his prophetic apostles here in the scriptures. Beyond those terms, let's just go briefly a few others. The scripture also refers in, in Acts chapter 9. Ananias said, verse 13, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. So right now, again, as, as we get this new and first designation of Christian, we're doing a brief survey of the, the designations and what they mean. Saints. Now, generally speaking, obviously, saints did not refer to any specific NFL teams at this point of giving. We've got that clear in our minds, right? Further, it did not refer to any individuals who are part of any historic tradition of Christianity. We know that there, there are some who like to say, well, this individual is a saint because they meet this specific criteria. And they make these curious things. They have to have done a miracle. They have to have done this and that. No! Someone was designated a saint in the scripture as and when by grace they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were brought out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the kingdom of this world, into the kingdom of light of his beloved son. And as you're transferred from one kingdom to another kingdom, you're now a citizen of heaven. You're now a part of the household of God. You are now a saint. Now that idea, the term hagias there in, in the Greek means holy. Again, I know you fall far short of that, as do I. But the, I, the primary idea of holy was separated. And in this sense, dedicated or consecrated. We are not yet perfect. I get that. But what this is saying, we are no longer dedicated to this world to any other idols or gods, or to ourself, but our dedication, our consecration, our designation is all and entirely to Jesus Christ. That's why we are the saints, separated unto, consecrated into Him. Now, the scriptures would also say, and I'll just briefly remind you of these, the Jews like to refer to the uh, believers as Nazarenes. Because they're referring to Jesus having been from Nazareth. And because Nazarenes as well as Galileans were looked down upon socially by the more educational elite of that time. So it, it was a way to marginalize them. A uh, very rarely used title. Or persons of the way. But note this. Here is where they were first called Christians. And it, it, it's curious to listen to commentators run circles around this, trying to determine whether Paul and Barnabas 
named them Christians, whether they voted on this name themselves, whether they were called it by those around them as a disparaging title, instead of realizing, we can't know that. <laughs> you know, why are we looking for the things that it doesn't say instead of listening to the things that it does say? It's good that they were disciples, but to simply call them disciples itself could leave things unclear. Disciples of who? Disciples of what? Who is their master? Who is it that they are following? And so this, this moving this direction, whether those in their community calling them that, or whether them desiring that designation, the whole point is this. Let the emphasis not be merely on, on who and what we are as disciples, but let the focus be on who we follow. Let it be known that we are disciples of Christ. And I, listen, I like to believe. If I say that, it means this has no authority at all. This is what, what I hope. And, and what I hope could be our own experience. That people would find that our, we, we take everything captive to Christ. When we talk about the weather, we relate it to God. When we talk about our experiences, it's often going back to, you know, thank God. Praise God. Because of the grace of Christ, we hope in Him. You know, this, whatever is in this world, we hope in Christ. And on and on, such that we might hope that through our own conversations, people would sense, why does this person always talk about Christ? <laughs> Christ finds his way into every conversation. And I honestly think it, it's not necessarily something that they set out to do. I've got to, I've got to weave Christ into every conversation. No. Christ is so woven into their hearts and into their thoughts that they can't weed him out of their conversations. That he is central. Now, we may have to, as, as our means of communication does get influenced by our society and community, uh, work to be a little bit more deliberate. But wouldn't it be glorious that we would speak so much of Christ that people would call us followers of Christ? Because, again, we don't want them to think we're mere moralists. Right? You heard this idea. Yo, oh, oh, this is this person now. The younger people have never heard this. I get it. But they used to, you know, call someone a goody two shoes. You know, I, I, I'm unsure who wears one shoe or three, so I don't quite understand the reference of two. But you've heard that phrase before, right? Oh, or, or a goody goody. Or but. But we don't want someone to think of us just as moral. We want them to know that our, that our moral stance is because of Christ. We, we want them to, to know we do what we do because of Christ. We abstain from what we abstain because of Christ. We love what we love because of Christ. Right? We're committed to and we work how we work because of Christ. Amen? And so we want that to be so clear that not only we ourselves would call us Christians, but others would. Now, of course, we tragically live in a day and age where many follow and hold to the term Christian. You might ask them, what are you? What is your religion? And they'll say Christian. But from day to day, are they Learning from, listening to, longing for, and following after Christ. If they're not, then they've misunderstood the term altogether. And would that they would stop using it. <laughs> because this is a term that's meant to, to not just be something that you call yourself on occasion. It's not meant to represent a, a, a small compartment or segment of your life. It is to be that thing with which, which most speaks of my identity is Christ. When I think of myself, I think of my life, I think of my future, it's Christ. Paul says it kind of in these terms. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And 
when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. Yeah, to die is gain when Christ is your life. But if something else in, is your life, right? Even if family is your life, what happens when you die? You're separated from them. There's loss. You know, if work, if company, if anything else is your life, to die is loss. To die is separation. But if Christ is your life, to die is gain. Glorious gain. Unimaginable gain as we see him as he is. What a beautiful unfolding of the simple terminology where they were first called Christians. Now, second thing I want to draw your attention to now going back to the beginning of this is expanding evangelism. Look what it says in verse 19 as we took this up today. Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyrus speaking the word. Now, sadly, it goes on to say to no one except Jews. And thankfully, some of those who had come from Greek-speaking places did finally speak it in Antioch. But I want you to note this. It wasn't a, the designated apostles who ended up going out everywhere and speaking the gospel. It wasn't even specially appointed evangelists. It was every single believer as they, as those who Christ was their life, as they scattered out from there, they went with a word. Everywhere. And some people like to say, well, I don't know what I would say. Well, here's what you would say. What you believe. <laughs> because if you have believed the gospel, that is the power of God to salvation, declare the gospel. Well, I don't know the gospel. Then, brother, hear the gospel that you might be saved. Because indeed, in, there's a sense in which everybody who has believed has believed what? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they've believed that, then those basic and glorious truths concerning the Son of God who came into a world of, abs of sinful man where all are dead in their sin and condemned. And he lived without sin. And he went to the cross. And he bore in his own body on the tree the sins of a multitude of people that all who come to him in repentance and faith find full forgiveness of sin and absolute acceptance with God in Christ. Glorious, isn't it? We just think... What a grace gift God has given us. And so if you're unsure or, or hesitant, get it. Think it through. Work it through. Because you, you get the sense is this. Nobody's kicking and prodding these people to speak about Christ. They now live their whole, their whole trajectory, their whole future hope, the purpose and, and, and primary thought in all of their daily decisions relate to Christ. And so as they go out and as they engage with people, now, why, why do they speak only to the Jews? Sadly, in that day and age, even as in our day and age, communities do oft stay to themselves. They come into a new community. They join the synagogue. They live in the Jewish quarter. They primarily move in and among their own people. But praise be to God who pushed the boundaries of that. And brought the gospel beyond. So that it would go on forward. In Acts chapter 8. It said this. Remember verse 1. Saul approved of Stephen's execution. And there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 4 says, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Amen? And in verse 20 says, uh, of Acts 11, verse 20, But there were some of them, men of Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, Preaching the Lord Jesus. 
Now, one of the things I just want to draw your attention to briefly in this, it said in verse 4 that the scattered went about preaching the word. And then here in 8.4 and 11.20 says preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, I just want to help you with this for a second. Because when it says preaching the word and preaching the Lord Jesus, many people are tending to think this. Well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not called to be a preacher. I mean, I, I'll share the gospel with people, but I'm not called to be a preacher. And I want to tell you this very clearly. I think the translators did us an injustice here. Because the word here is euangelizmanoi. Which is the word from which we get evangelism. That is proclaimed the good news of the word. Proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, in the practical sense... Uh, uh, in the pulpit before the people, not all are called to be teachers and preachers. Sure. But all are called to proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the good news. Because now we live as those. What is the hope of glory? Christ in you is the hope of glory. And that hope pervades all of our decisions. All of our hardships, all of our trials, all of our struggles. And so therefore it comes out in all of our conversations. And so we love this. In Ephesians 4.12, the scripture in speaking about those whose responsibility it is to be overseers in the church. To be the pastors and elders in the church. It says of their work, of their responsibility to equip the saints... For the work of ministry. Ephesians 4.12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. I want us to get this very clear. Because we've got this common cultural prevailing idea. That ministry is the job of ministers. It's the job of paid professionals. Nonsense. <laughs> the scripture says. Uh, well, among other things. One of my primary responsibilities. Is equip you. For the work of ministry. So if someone was to come to you and ask you today. Brother. Sister. How's your ministry going? What will be your response? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a ministry. Yeah you do. <laughs> you ought to. You're a believer. A light. Placed in a world of darkness. You are to be salt and light. Tell us, tell me about your ministry. How's it going? How can I pray for you? And, and some of us, maybe we, we hold the bar of ministry too high. As we engage our neighbors, as we engage our co-workers, as we interact even to encourage and provoke our brothers and sisters to love and good work. You know, uh, sometimes we think ministry has to be this high line and this high bar. But it's often the simple daily activities I would love to see people thinking, well, I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not in ministry until I finally give up everything and go overseas and live among the poor. No! You're in ministry every single day. And actually, giving up everything and going among the poor isn't going to change who you are. You ought to be doing right here, right now, everything that you would hope to do over there in that place. If, you, if you're not a teacher and preacher here, you should not be a teacher and preacher overseas. It, you know, if you're not mentoring and discipling people here, you should not be doing that overseas. So that leaving the country, getting a pass in your, getting a stamp in your passport does not suddenly make you something you are not. Ideally, what should be happening is as we serve, the church itself would be saying, this individual seems to be called in this way, gifted in this way. Have you considered more training? Have you considered whether or not God would call you to go overseas? And we work and we give and we lift up. But look, and we don't compare. One may be a mouth. One may be an ear, one may be a hand, one may be a foot. The hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. So the point isn't that you compare your ministry with others, but that you're faithful where God has put you and where God has appointed you.
And if, if you see opportunities and you find yourself ill-equipped to meet those opportunities, I urge you to come to me and say, I've got these opportunities and I'm not quite sure how to address it so that I can more faithfully fulfill my responsibility to equip you for the work of ministry that God has set before you. So we see that uh, this is expanding. But I do want to note this as well. Because on the other side, you end up getting... So you have sometimes saints who make excuses to, to do nothing. Ought not be. We all ought to be involved in ministry. Then you get pastors at times who will say, I'll equip you for the work of ministry. You go and do it. I, this, I'm not going. Whoa, no, 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 no. You also go too. I love the way as Timothy was serving as an elder, as we know in Ephesus, Paul even writes to him and reminds him of these simple words. As for you. 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. Always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. He did not graduate from evangelism school to pastor school. <laughs> he did not, didn't leave those things behind. Well, that's for you, and, and, I, and I'm above that now. No! We're all about that. We're all about declaring the name. We're all about the service. And, and it shouldn't be about what, what is the minimum I can do to get by. What, what, is, what is the minimum that God expects from me? That shouldn't be what we're about, should it? It should be, where are there ways in which I can serve the Lord in my workplace? Well, how can I serve Him better in my family? How can I, can, how can I serve Him better in the church? I mean, what a wonderful thing if from time to time, not only just maybe coming to me and say, hey, how can I serve in the church? But going to one another and saying, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Is there, how can I serve you? How can I help you as we come along together side by side? Thirdly, I want us to pay attention to this passage where we see not only descriptive designations, we see not only expanding evangelism, but we see very clearly that grace is granted. We know that. Grace is not owed. It's not given under some obligation. If it's a, obligated, if it's a reward, if it's required, it's not grace at all. Because we oft will define it as that which is given that is completely unmerited, unearned, and undeserved. And so we, uh, we, we see these words really going back at the very end of verse 18. It had said this. They glorified God saying the Gentiles also God has granted the repentance that leads to life. They understood. They thought that God had drawn a line between them and the Gentiles. They understood that God had given them under the old covenant a special position and a special place and a special love and special benefits in relation to him. And now they're understanding, aha, God has also now under the new covenant, he has given his special saving purposes in Christ, not only to Jews, but also to the Gentiles. But they know this, God is the one who decides and God is the one who gives. God granted it to them. I love the language that, that unfolds even in here. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 11 verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Verse 23 it says, When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. So the hand of the Lord was with them and many believed and turned to the Lord. Now it's important to note that. What brought about this powerful effect? It wasn't skillful preaching. It wasn't persuasive language. It wasn't a sensitive and receptive community. The determining factor that brought about the effect was what? The hand of the Lord was with them. And so we've got to understand that. If we say, I don't think I can communicate very effectively. Good. Because maybe you won't trust your effective communication. Because it's not we who save anybody. We plant a seed. We pour water. But as, as, as 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians, neither he who plants or waters is anything, but God provides the growth. And that's important to know because if God is pleased in our loving sharing of the gospel to stretch, stretch out his hand and draw many to himself as we heard in the opening reading today. No man comes unless the Father draws him. If God sets his hand and draws people to himself, we can't say, look how effective I am. Look what I'm accomplishing. We can't say that and ought not. We get to say, oh God, thank you for the privilege of serving you and then seeing your hand at work. Saving your people from their sins. Oh, to see. And I love what it says. When he got there, he didn't see the response of men. He didn't see the effectiveness of the evangelist. He saw the grace of God. That's what he attributed it all to. He saw the grace of God and what? Was glad. There is a joy and rejoicing that wells up in our heart when we see the hand of God. Now note this. Uh, uh, Paul, in the context of his ministry, as we'll see as we get later on, he would go to some places and start planting seeds. And what would happen? They would throw him out of town, run him out of town in riots, and sometimes there would seem to be nothing done. He'd end up in other places like Corinth, and, and, and the Lord would say, hey, don't be afraid, stay here, for I have many people in this city. And he would stay there, and he would minister the word. And, and, and so what we recognize is Paul's method of ministry, from what we read in the scripture, does not change. From place to place, from city to city. But in some places, riots and expulsion. In other places, seemingly wholesale revival. Well, what makes the difference? The hand and purposes of God in his providence at that time. And it may be that he comes back through and, and at times there was a place where there were riots. A few of them had believed and he meets with them and encourages them. And then God ends up establishing and working together a church in that place. Some of the places it seems Paul went, he, he planted a lot of seed, but to, to no effect. He didn't see many conversions. Apollos came after and poured water and got to, got to see. So, so who gets the credit for the church that's planted there? Paul or Apollos? And the answer is neither. The glory goes to God. The glory goes to God for every single soul that is saved. Right? Because even the gospel message that we proclaim. Did we invent it? No, and the gospel's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the very message that he himself has given us. So that all praise and glory goes to him and to him alone. So much so that, that Paul could even say when, uh, when he was writing to the church at Philippi, there are some who are preaching out of rivalry and envy. Their motives aren't right. Their motives are kind of self-serving. But the gospel is being preached. Christ is being proclaimed, and so people are being saved. So the, the, the person doing it may ultimately be lost. But if he's declaring the right gospel, and it's a curious thing because it's happened from time to time where even a preacher or an evangelist will come one day under the convicting grace of the Spirit of God and brought to repentance and new life, and they'll say... I've been preaching for 20 years, but God saved me this week. Oh, brother, that can't be true because it, through, through your message, God saved me. Well, it wasn't I who saved you. It was God through the message that saved you. And praise God that in spite of the individual's failure or shortcoming at that time, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, not the evangelist. Praise God, right? And so we see the grace of God granted. And when he saw the grace of God, he was glad. But when we see the grace of God, when we see the grace granted, 
How do we recognize that? Well, let's look at the empowered effects or the empowered evidences of true belief. It says in uh, verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now, grammatically, this is a very challenging section in the Greek. The King James says it this way, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The, the way that these, these verbs are lined up, it's, it's, it's not two different things. Well, some of those who believed turned, and some of those who believed, yeah, they did. No, 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 no. That's not the sense that's being said there. It's wanting, to, it's wanting to draw you to the fact that the faith that God gives. Remember, we, we are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. The grace, the faith, the salvation is all granted, Ephesians 2.8 says. Here it also, it says, those who believed turned to the Lord. Turned, I like it, it's turned unto or turned into the Lord. How do you know that the grace of God has been poured out? People have turned direction. Of, they've turned, not only the, the sense of it, it wants you to know this. It's not just that they've changed what they believe. But when someone's beliefs have truly changed... It has completely turned their direction. It, 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 to, to use the language that was used of the accusations against the early apostles. Uh, they are turning the world upside down. And that's what happens when the grace of God comes to us in faith. It turns our world upside down. We thought this was right. We thought this was the way. We thought this is how. But now we understand. Christ is the son of God. His truth, His way, His glory, His pleasure. The grace of God shows in the, that people are turned. And not only do they commit to the Lord. Turning. So it's important to note this. Some people get, uh, they get caught up in this. Well, salvation is all of grace. Therefore, it is all of God. And so they, they, they start to think, uh, well... And they minimize men's response to the gospel. We ought not do that. I want to give you an example of that. For example, God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, right? In him we live and move and breathe and have our being. He has given us breath, right? Because God gives us breath, we breathe. Right? He doesn't breathe for us. Because he gives us life... We're alive. Because he gives us breath, we breathe. Because he's given us sight, we see. Because he's given us hearing, we hear. Because he's given us faith, we believe. And in believing, we commit, we turn, we dedicate, we follow. There is a response, there is a resolve that's even called for from men. Now, the only way that men respond is when that is empowered and enabled by the grace of God. But you do get people on the, on the side that recognize men are powerless apart from the grace of God. Yes. And so they treat all men that they share with as though maybe grace won't come to them. We plead with men, turn from your sin. We plead with men, turn to Christ. Knowing full well that only when the grace of God is poured out upon them will they do so. But we plead with them. Amen? And not only that, not only do they commit to or turn to, but they continue in. Look at verse 21. It says, um, or, or, or further down, not in verse 21, but as... Uh, uh, Barnabas comes down and it speaks to them. He saw the grace of God, verse 23, and was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. The King James there says, with purpose of heart that they would cleave unto the Lord. Yeah. Turn to and cleave to. 
Uh, some like to say uh, that's, that's, the, that's the whole sense of conversion. He's calling them uh, to not only make this turn and make this commitment ta- now, but they should cling to him, cleave to him. They should be adhered to him, connected to him, unbreakably unified with him. Such powerful words. Then the last thing I do, I want to draw or almost the last thing. The next thing I want to draw our attention to in this passage, the sent servant. All right. There were men there who were evangelists. And as a result of evangelism, there were people who were believing. But though all believers are equipped and ought to rightly share the gospel, not all are equipped to church plant. Not all are called out and, and, and trained to be church leaders. And so when the word came back to Jerusalem that there's a group of believers here, they sent a man. They sent an equipped man. They sent a faithful man. They sent a trained man. And that man was Barnabas. It describes Barnabas in Acts chapter 11 verse 24. For he was a good man. And you say, but no one is good except God. That is true. No one is truly good except God. But the grace of God, powerfully evident in the life of a man, makes him in comparison relative to others gooder. I know that's not good English. Sorry, English professor. But uh, it, that's, it, it changes us. So he had... By grace has proven himself to be a faithful man of God. And it says what? And full of the spirit and faith. A good man full of the spirit and faith. We also remember in, in verse uh, uh, Acts chapter 4. His original name was Joseph. And they called him verse 36 Barnabas. Which means son of encouragement. So already from the beginning. He's, his nature is to come alongside people. Exhort them. Encourage them. Seek to empower them. We see his generosity. He had sold a field. And he brought the money and brought it to them. We're further uh, reminded that in uh, Acts chapter 9. Saul had come back. Who later we will call Paul. And everybody was afraid of him. And not ready to accept him. But who met with him. Heard him out. And then commended him to others, even the apostles. Barnabas did. He brought him to the apostles and declared how he, to them how on the road he had seen the Lord and spoke. And how on Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of the Lord. Now, I just want to say this by, by way of, of, of simple thought. In Acts chapter 6, they selected seven men who would be made deacons. Now among those deacons were men with an evangelistic gift. Stephen. And Philip. You know who is not listed among those deacons? Barnabas. Because we, I want you to understand this. The role of a deacon serves wonderfully many of the practical needs in the local church. But it's not the training ground for a pastor. It's not step one. You got to first be a deacon and prove yourself as a deacon. And that, that's step one to becoming an elder. Becoming No, 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 no. It's not. Barnabas didn't go through those things. And probably because Barnabas was early on involved in encouragement, exhorting, teaching ministry. He was not involved in some of those other practical aspects of waiting on tables. Because he was being more equipped and trained up. And remember he also then went. Scripture tells us here. In verse 25. Barnabas went to Tarsus. To look for Saul. When he found him. He brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year. They met and taught the church. And we know Saul's training. So it's good. For there to be believers. But wherever they're believers, it's, it's also necessary that God would, would bring and that we would send men to those places who are equipped and sound and able to teach the disciples and able to organize and coordinate the church, protect it with sound doctrine and from error, that they might be deeply and well established. And the last thought this morning from this passage is we see in here, how absolutely God-centered and word-focused it is. Now, now, you might not have seen this on first reading, but I'm gonna, oh, as I read it to you now, I'm hoping that, that, that this, this begins to light up to you. As we're going through this passage, and it says that they've come down. Verse 20, it says they were preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. 
Still verse 21. A great number believed and turned to the Lord. I love that. Believed and turned to the Lord. Not merely were added to the church. Not merely were added to the saints. But turned to the Lord. I love that remembrance that, it, that, that he's the one that we're, we're joined to. Verse 23, saw the grace of God and urged them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Verse 24 again says, added to the Lord. And verse 25 says they were called Christians. That emphasis on Christ. So the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, Christ, Christians. Do you see that emphasis? May we always hear that. May, may it be that in all of our language and in all of our life, that we end up speaking more of and thinking more of God than ourselves. More of God than of man and, and men's institution and men's gathering and men's organizations. As blessed and encouraging as those things all are, we want to remain primarily God-centered. And word focused. They preached the word. They taught the word. They unfolded these things. So in this section today. We've seen six simple things. And I'm going to remind you of these before we pray. The descriptive designations. They were disciples. They were learners. Students. They were brothers. Speaking members of a household of God. They were saints. Separated. No longer of the world. But now belonging to Christ. And designated for him. They would be designated Nazarenes or Galileans spoken of by others with disparaging terms. Persons of the way because we recognize the singularity and exclusiveness of the gospel and God and Christ. And they were called Christians because Christ is what seemed to most characterize them. And what they desired or what others saw ought to be what characterized it. So those descriptive designations. We saw evangelism expanded by believers sharing the gospel. As they went, they shared the gospel. All disciples are to be proclaimers of the good news that they themselves have received of Jesus Christ our Lord. We know that grace is granted. So we need not fear. What if they won't listen? What if I can't influence them? You don't worry about that. God we pray that you would draw these people. Give them ears to hear. Give them eyes to see. Give them hearts and minds to believe. God grant that I would speak your word faithfully. And bring your lost sheep into the fold. We rest on the grace of God granted. And when we see the grace of God. We are glad. And we rejoice. We, we look for and call for those empowered effects. We urge people to turn. To repent. To be baptized. We urge them to commit to. And we urge them to continue in. Even as I urge you all today. Cleave to Christ. With all that you have. We see the sent servants. As much as it is important for us all. To have a ministry. And to serve among one another. God has nonetheless appointed under shepherds. Who protect the sheep. From the dangers of false teaching. Even from wolves that rise up. From among the sheep. It's important that God's churches. Are led by men that have been. Designated out and properly equipped. To protect God's people. So we want to see that among ourselves. And pray that for all the churches out there. Not self-appointed, self-trained, self-designated, but those that are even recognized and sent by established churches such as these men. And finally, God-centered, word-focused in all that we do. May God grant us to see these things, hear these things, be these things for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, once again, in the same way, I know that... Uh, what a privilege it is to declare your word, to declare your truth, to point out these blessed things that are revealed in your scripture. But it is you who can take and apply these things deeply to the hearts of your people. I pray that you would do so, that you would help us to take up those designations and recognize the richness of them.
Lord, that we would thank you for the grace that has been granted us. That we would be earnest in those things that your grace has empowered in our commitment and our, our continuing in. God, we ask that you would stir up within us and excite a greater desire that we would speak your gospel to others. And in doing so, it is your gospel. We not only speak of that forgiveness is available. We not only speak of that salvation is given. But we say, behold, your God. Here is our God and the provision that he's made. The righteousness that he has provided. The forgiveness that is in him. Lord, you, may you always be the heart and center of our gospel and of our grace and of our glory. In Jesus' name, amen.